Okay, so good morning, everyone. Uh, this is going to be a short lecture today. Alfredo is going to take over for the second half. Um, so I'm going to be uh, talking about uh, the practice of uh, convolutional nets, how they are used in, in various ways. And the first thing I should say is that they are used a lot and they're used uh, almost everywhere where there is uh, image recognition to be done, but also in a lot of other applications. Um, and we'll, we'll go through some of them, not entirely today, but perhaps uh, in subsequent lecture. Today, I'm going to be speaking mostly about computer vision. Um, and um, I'm going to be illustrating some of those views uh, with sort of a little bit of sort of historical ways that, that those things have been kind of uh, proposed, you know, going back to the early 1990s. Um, there are uh, tens of thousands of papers published every year on using convolutional nets for various things. And so I cannot possibly do an exhaustive uh, overview of, of everything. Um, just looking at the, the CVPR conference, which is sort of the main computer vision conference, there, there are just there are thousands of papers literally every year on just on this topic, right? So, um, um, so much that, you know, any, nobody can really keep track of it. Um, and certainly not me. Um, Okay, uh, so we, we talked about the, the basic uh, modules uh, that, that form a convolutional net last week and, and sort of the, the very basic architecture of convolutional net where you stack convolution operations or multiple convolution operations um, interspersed with uh, nonlinearities and pooling operations where the uh, uh, spatial or temporal uh, dimension is, um, is reduced. Um, and we can ask ourselves, what are convolutional nets good for? And so the, the, the design of it um, is, uh, you know, comes from the idea that, you know, the idea of convolution comes from the fact that you can have features that can appear anywhere on the image. Uh, and so you, if you want a feature detector at one location, it's a good idea to have the same feature detector, detector, detector at another location. Um, so there comes the idea of local feature detectors and then replicating them over the over the, the field of view, essentially, right? Which is the idea of correlation. Um, now, this is due to properties of signals that um, uh, natural signals in particular, um, things that come to you in the form of an array, a multidimensional array or a single dimensional array, right? So it can be a, a time series, it could be multiple time series. So it'd be a multi-channel one dimensional array, if you want. So in effect, a two dimensional array. Um, it could be an image, which is a two dimensional array be a color image or a multispectral image. So an image that has more than three colors, right? That's the sensors that can do this. Um, for example, with bands in infrared and ultraviolet, there's a lot of satellite imaging, for example, that have hundreds of bands. So that would be a three-dimensional array uh, where two of the dimensions are actually organized, but the third dimension, not necessarily, right? They could be just channels that don't have any structure to them, um, any order, if you want. Um, and, and then, uh, you can have four-dimensional arrays. So four-dimensional arrays would be, uh, another example of three-dimensional array would be volumetric images. So the kind of image you get out of an MRI machine, for example, uh, or uh, in some cases, some sensors uh, like LiDAR, which basically gives you uh, an XYZ location for every, every point it, uh, it looks at. So it, so it gives you not just uh, uh, you know, an image with grayscale, uh, you could think of the grayscale being replaced by a depth, right? And you could interpret this either as a, as a 2D uh, image with different values or as a 3D image uh, where, you know, each voxel uh, indicates the presence or absence of an object in it. Um, there are actually libraries to deal with this. Uh, there's something called PyTorch 3D, which does a bit of that. Um, then uh, uh, other 3D uh, data includes video. Um, or 4D data in, in, is it would be color video, right? Uh, and and you can imagine you know all kinds of signals that have you know more more dimensions, right? If you have like a, a video of volumetric image, like you know what you get from a um, ultrasound, for example, or or uh, short-term MRI, functional MRI uh, images for the brain, things like that. Um, okay. So that's the first property. The data comes to you in the form of an array. The second property is that the signals have strong local correlations, which means that uh, neighboring values, pixels, voxels, whatever, uh, are likely to have to take similar values. Okay, so this is the case for an image. 
if you take neighboring pixels in an image and you compute the statistics of how different are two neighboring pixels in an image, they're generally not very different unless you have an edge in this image, but edges are rare actually, okay? Um, but as the distance between the two pixels you're measuring grows, the likelihood that those two pixels have similar color decreases. Okay, so what that suggests is that you have strong local correlations. And th what that suggests is that uh, there are uh, patterns when you take a, a block of five pixels, um, you know, five by five pixels, for example, uh, or maybe more, the type of patterns you observe does not cover the set of all possible combinations of pixels because of those correlations, okay? So what that suggests is that it's interesting to detect uh, particular combinations of, uh, of those pixels flat uniform areas, uh, soft gradients, edges, maybe gratings, uh, things like that, right? So what that means is that you can sort of abstract the content of, uh, of, of such a, a patch in an image by a list of presence or absence of particular features, right? So that's kind of the idea. Um, but that's due to the fact that you have strong local correlations, right? So if you were to take a, an image and randomly permute the pixels so that you, you break the local correlations and you plug a convolutional net to it, the convolutional net wouldn't do very well. Uh, a, fully a fully connected network will work exactly the same, right? Fully connected network doesn't care about the topology of the input. It comes at a price because you have to connect everything to everything. Um, uh, so it's not always a good idea to use that. Um, so convolutional nets exploit this lo local correlation uh, and the, the weight sharing, you know, exploit the fact that uh, features basically can appear anywhere because, you know, you can move your eyes or your camera and you never know where a particular object will appear or a particular feature. Um, and that's basically the, 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 the fourth property, signals in which objects are subject to uh, translations, uh, distortions, et cetera. Uh, and you want the system to be able to recognize those objects or classify them independently of those distortions, right? Uh, and that's basically uh, provided, kind of hardwired a little bit by the, the pooling operation. Uh, okay, so when the signals include text, music, audio, uh, speech, uh, time series, uh, you know, and, and, and things of that type, uh, 2D convnets, as I said, uh, image, um, images, but also time frequency representations of a speech and audio. Um, so this is basically a way of turning uh, an audio signal or, or speech signal into basically an image where one dimension is time and the other dimension is frequency and every value indicates the energy of uh, the signal at that, in that particular frequency band at that particular time, okay? Um, the spectrogram is an example of this. Um, and so this, uh, you know, this kind of representation is used for recognition, localization, detection, things like that. And then 3D convnet for, for video, uh, biomedical images, uh, hyperspectral image uh, images. So this is the example I was uh, citing of satellite images where you don't have to just three colors. You, you might have like 100 different channels of different uh, frequency bands. Uh, that's, that's used for astronomy as well, spectro spectroscopy basically. Um, so they are the, the, the color if you want, is a third dimension, right? So there's a lot of information in every pixel and uh, that changes the thing. So, you know, why uh, why do we need to stack layers uh, in in convnets? Why is it interesting to stack layers? For the same reason that you know deep learning is a good idea, um, we need to stack layers. But it's due to the fact that um, uh, the, the the world is is compositional uh, in a way. And I you know I alluded to this a little last time. So in a in a convolutional net, when you train a convolutional net to do image recognition to classify objects, for example, what you what you see, and this is a visualization by uh, Rob Fergus and his former student, Matt Ziller. Uh, what you see is feature detectors at a low level that detect those simple uh, motifs, uh, oriented edges and you know, color gradients and things like, this, things like this. So essentially what I was just saying, motifs that um, appear surprisingly often in, uh, in images and are informative for whatever task. And it doesn't matter what task you train this convnet to do, it will almost always come up with things like this, okay? It will always be slightly different, but um, Things like this, essentially. Now, what you can try to do is try to figure out uh, what is the, the input um, pattern that will maximally activate a particular unit at a particular layer, okay? The, the network that has been tested here uh, is something that has something like 20 layers. And so um, uh, 
so I'm only representing three of them, but at, at some level, somewhere, uh, there are feature detectors here that detect things like circles and gratings and corners and, and you know, simple kind of local shapes and motifs, uh, which then in subsequent layers are assembled to basically form parts of objects. So it's it's sort of, sort of a weird visualization here, but um, but that's essentially kind of patterns that will maximally activate a particular detector in a particular layer in a convolutional net. Um, and this you know, is appropriate for, uh, for natural uh, data because the, the world is, is compositional in the sense that, um, uh, you know, in physics is, is clearly the case. Uh, uh, you know, we have uh, elementary particles at the low level uh, or, you know, string even at the lower level, although that's not verified, but, uh, but let's say elementary particles like quarks and, 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 and things like that and, and bosons and whatever. And those uh, assemble to form other particles like neutrons and protons, and then those assemble to form atoms, and then those assemble to form molecules and then materials, and then, you know, parts of objects, objects, uh, you know, collection of objects and planets and scenes and things like that, right? So uh, there is this sort of, uh, hierarchy in, in 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 physics or in, in in natural science, and every level has a different name, right? So there's this high energy physics at the bottom, and then there is uh, you know solid state physics or or, or condensed matter physics, uh, and then there is uh, um, uh, chemistry uh, or physical chemistry. Then there is uh, uh, organic chemistry, where you have big molecules, and then and then you know biology or, or bio biochemistry. And then biology, and then you know you need multiple levels of description, uh, you know. And then when we talk about like human society, there is economics and sociology and stuff like that, right? Psychology. So uh, at every level, we have a different lev level of description of reality that uses different concepts, and it's this idea of hierarchy, right? So that's one reason why perhaps the the this this idea of, of hierarchy is um, is a good idea. Um, and uh, the, one of the big mysteries of the universe is why is it that the world is so organized that in such a way that we can actually understand it? Um, because it could be a complete mess that we cannot possibly understand. Um, there's a famous quote by uh, Albert Einstein, which I don't remember if I told you already. Um, maybe Alfredo does. Uh, uh, he says, he said, uh, the most incomprehensible thing about the world is that the world is comprehensible and and or understandable, and and this is the the reason is because it's it's compositional. So we so we have uh, levels of description that kind of describe in some abstract level what happens at the lower level, uh, uh, ignoring the details. Uh, in fact, there are uh, explicit models of uh, uh, physics that um, things like like something called tensor networks. Uh, and they 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 have uh, architectures to basically represent the interaction between um, sort of different quantities uh, that look very much like convolutional nets. Is one called uh, uh, so the, the two techniques one called renormalization group theory, which kind of describes a complex system uh, by abstracting the the local details, if you want. Uh, so, so this is used in uh, uh, condensed matter uh, physics, and then uh, things like this multi-scale entanglement. Reg a renormalization and that's that also called MERA. It looks very much like a convolutional net and it's kind of designed to represent the complex interaction that occur between sort of different uh, quantities. Um, so this, you know, probably some sort of deep cosmic reason for multilayer systems, you know, to be useful and probably why we, we have them in our, in our brain. Okay, let's, uh, let's come back to earth um, a little bit and, and talk about the practicality of, uh, of, of convolutional nets. And so we talked about convolutional nets for single objects, um, but it turns out you can use convolutional nets uh, as a detector or as a way of recognizing multiple objects. Um, we'll talk about the more kind of comp complex way of doing this in a subsequent lecture on structure prediction, but I'm gonna tell you kind of the basic idea here. Um, so pretty early on in the early 90s, we realized that we could apply uh, convolutional nets not just to recognize a single object, but multiple objects, right? So what you see here is uh, a convolutional net that has been trained to recognize a 32 by 32 image. Uh, so, it, so every output, if you want, is influenced by a 32 by 32 input. But in fact, the convolutional net ha has, after training, has been made bigger. So the input was extended to 64 by 32, right? So the, 
or 32 vertically by 64 horizontally. And what happened to the convolutional net is that we kind of replicated it over uh, multiple windows of, of 32 pixels. And so, um, and I'll, I'll tell you in a minute how, how, that, how that's done, okay? Um, so imagine that you take a, a, you know, a 32 by 32 window, run your favorite convolutional net for character recognition. It gives you a, sc a score for each category, right? Then you shift this by a few pixels, let's say four pixels, and it gives you another answer. And then you shift it by another four, four pixels. So whenever a character is more or less centered in that window, the, this particular combat will actually produce a reliable answer as to what it's, it's seeing within this, this window. Um, you can train the system. When you, when you train it, you show it characters that are centered and tell it, you know, you show it a five and you say that's a five. And then you show a five that's slightly off center and you tell it, don't answer anything because it's not centered. You can't tell what it is. So you train it to explicitly not produce anything, right? So this is, there's no soft max on the output, basically. Um, you just turn off all the, all the, uh, all the outputs. Um, and, uh, and what you can also do is uh, show a character in the center uh, during training and then show other characters on the side that you can bring uh, uh, you know, more or less close to the character in the center, but train the system to only recognize the, the one in the center, basically to ignore the, the ones on the side. Um, and then uh, you, you can also show kind of uh, images where you have two characters on the side and nothing in the center, and you again train it to produce none of the above, okay? So when you take this, uh, this neural net and you shift it over the input, uh, it's going to turn on and detect a character whenever there is one that's more or less centered in it. Uh, and, and then it will probably say none of the above whenever there is you know, no decent character that uh, is being centered. So this is an example of this, where, where this uh, call net has been kind of shifted um, uh, every four pixels, right? The, the input window is 32 pixels. And what you see uh, here are, is the winning category with where the intensity of the grayscale indicates the score, if you want, of the winning category. So this system kind of detects you know, the five in multiple places whenever it looks like a five. Uh, the one is basically only one, uh, one location. Um, and what, this, what you see is that the system doesn't quite care you know, where the characters end and begin. It basically figures out which parts of the image kind of fit with each other to produce uh, a score. Um, so uh, as I said, this is a, an old idea that was de developed in the lab that was working in at, uh, at Bell Labs um, uh, at AT&T. And, and, and here is how you do it in practice. So that turns out to be extremely cheap to do, this idea of kind of replicating a, a convolutional net over, over an input, uh, over a larger input, and handling uh, variable size inputs. We used to call this uh, SDNN, which stands for Space Displacement Neural Net, but it's really just a convolutional net, okay? Um, and so imagine that you've trained a single character recognizer whose input window is 32 by 32, or in this case, maybe a little more, okay? And you want to uh, apply it with a sliding window over the entire, uh, over a bigger input representing a, uh, a word, for example, a handwritten word. Uh, the way you do this is you don't recompute the convolutional net at every location. You don't need to do this because um, uh, when you shift the, this, the, the convolutional net on the left by a few pixels, there's a whole bunch of layers, uh, you know, activations you already computed, right? Because you're using the same weights all over. Uh, so, so the basic idea here is that you extend the size of the convolutions, um, which you can do without retraining anything, okay? You use the same weights that you had for this network, you just make the input bigger and you apply the convolution. And so the output gets bigger automatically, okay? And every layer gets bigger uh, according to, to that. Um, and now what you have to think about is that um, what I told you uh, were fully connected layers uh, last week that we put on top of the, of, the, you know, of the convolutional net for the last few layers. I lied to you, they're not actually fully connected layers. They are actually convolutional layers as well with a convolution kernel of size one by one. Okay, so I need to unpack this a little bit. So I'm first going to show you uh, a, a sort of explicit example of this, uh, this little uh, demo I, I showed you earlier. So this shows the, when, when you take a, a particular output, um, uh, let's say the, the red output here, that you know, detects either a five or a six or a three. Uh, when you back project it on the previous layer, you get um, uh, a feature vector, which is basically, basically a column of, of this uh, P 
feature vector here. I'm representing only one value here as, as a little red square. Um, okay, so it's just a single value, but because it's multiple channels, you have 120 of those because there is 120 channels. Uh, those are connected to uh, you know those red squares uh, uh, on the previous layer and every feature map um, represented by this. Um, the size of this, I believe, is five by five. Um, and then you go back to the previous layer, which you know is uh, I don't remember if this is before or after pooling. I think it's after pooling. Um, so the input window you get here is something like like uh, 10 by 10, I believe, or something like that. Um, and then there is uh, a pooling, which is two by two, and then convolution. And so you get the 32 by 32 uh, uh, input. Uh, so you you draw the diagram of this, and 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 those those sizes just you know come out of it. Now, when you make the convolution larger on the input. The next output, because of the various subsampling uh, pooling layers, is going to be shifted by four pixels. And I'll make a drawing that explains why this is, OK, in a minute. Uh, so each of these guys, you know, the, the output here, the, the green output, looks at a window that is shifted by four pixels from the previous one. Uh, why four? It's because there are two layers of uh, two by two subsampling. And so the overall subsampling ratio is four. And what that means is that when you shift the output by one, you shift the input by four. Or when you shift the input by four, you shift the output by one. Okay, um, but again, I'll I'll, I'll draw this uh, so you get a better idea idea for uh, for that. Okay, so now what we have is basically a collection of uh, answers with various scores. And what we have to do is uh, what's called non-maximum suppression. Okay, NMS. Uh, this is used universally in computer vision, and what that means is that. Uh, you see, at one point, uh, th there are three detectors, I mean, three instances of this, uh, of the output that detect the number five. Okay. Uh, one of them, for one of them, the five is kind of centered. For the other ones, it's kind of on the side, but they, they see it's a five, so they say it's a five. Now, you have to have some post processing that says there's only one five. Okay. And that's called non maximum suppression. So basically, you take the scores of all the categories within a small window and you say, who is winning? Which category has the highest score within this window? And I'm just going to use this guy as the winner and then suppress the uh, everybody else. So I know there is only one five, even though there are three five detectors that turn on because uh, uh, they're all seeing the same five, really. Okay. Same for the, the 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 seven here. It appears twice. You know, only one of them. So this is basically what happens here between this uh, list of detections here and the the final answer, which only contains two characters. It's a kind of non-maximum suppression. It's done with what's called a weighted finite state machine, but I'm not going to go into the details of this um, um, until we talk about structure prediction. Um, but there are many ways to do non-maximum suppression. And in fact, it's kind of going away a little bit because now people are replacing this handcrafted process by actually a, a, a trainable neural net as well. The training non-maximum suppression, if you want. Uh, OK, so let me. Uh, uh, so here's another example of uh, an early object detection system with uh, with convolutional net, probably the first one actually, um, uh, from a paper that I, I co-authored with um, a few people in in 1993, although the work was done in 1991. Um, and this is the same idea. This was for phase detection. Um, uh, so the data sets at the time were, were really small. Uh, we had to collect our own. It was only only a couple thousand images or something. Uh, so the idea there for detection is that you take um, you take a collection of images, some of which have faces, some of which do have no faces. Okay, no face uh, from whatever a photo that that you took that you're pretty sure has no has no people in them. Um, and then you train uh, a neural net, which in this case had an input of twenty two of twenty by twenty pixels. You train it to say uh, you know turn on the output whenever there is a face and turn off whenever the, whenever there is no face. Uh, and um, and you do this only for for you know input windows of uh, twenty by twenty uh, pixels. And then what you do to uh, do face detection is that you you slide this uh, convolutional net over over an image, and whenever there's a face that is roughly twenty by twenty pixels, it's going to turn on. Okay. Now the problem is that faces can appear at different sizes. So what you do now is you take your image, you subsample it by some some factor, another scale. And you apply your network again at that new scale, and then do it again for even a, another scale, right? So eventually, 
uh, there's going to be one scale where the faces appear to be roughly at the right size, and uh, and where your detector is going to is going to turn on. So these are the detection maps here that you see. Um, so uh, I think bright means uh, high score for detection, and and dark means uh, no detection. Uh, those appear bright, but they're not actually that good of a detection. So you need a kind of a blob of activity for the, the detection to be high scoring. And you see them here at you know scale eight, for example, or scale seven, scale six, you have kind of blobs of, of high score activities that kind of represent the presence of, uh, uh, of a phase. So here you do non-maximum suppression again. You say for every location and scale, uh, which is the blob that has the highest overall score, and you decide that's a winning uh, a candidate, and you suppress the other ones. And that's the result in the end, what you get here on the uh, on the right uh, with the, the four winners. So let me uh, uh, tell you a bit about those this this uh, replication over a field that I was uh, I was just telling you about. Um, okay, so let's say you have uh, an input image, and you're going to apply uh, a first convolutional net. I'm going to draw it red. It's a very simple convolutional net. It's got um, three uh, kernel size three. Okay, then uh, pooling, and then another kernel. Okay, so this is convolution, pooling, convolution. And this is pooling by two, convolution by three. Okay, you get an output, right? Now let's imagine you want to apply the same convolutional net uh, shifted by, let's say, two pixels, okay? Um, so I'm going to draw that uh, convolutional net again. Okay, this is the very same convolutional net applied to a window shifted by two pixels. All right. Now, notice that this part of the network Is shared between those two those two instances of the of the convolutional net, right? I do not need to recompute those those pink units here because I already computed them. Okay, so it would be it would be stupid to recompute the entire network since I already computed you know part part of it, right? And if I kind of keep going there, uh, you can imagine, of course, that um, uh, if I if I shift by by um, by by two pixels again, um, you know, I'm going to get a third uh, network. Uh, sorry, I forgot one. Here we go. And again, you know, I don't need to uh, recompute those those pink guys. Okay, they are in common. So, what do I have to do in the end? What I have to do in the end is Basically, I just take my entire input. Um, so it turns out to be like super simple. I take my entire input and I just compute a convolution over the entire input. I just apply my convolution and I get uh, a layer here that is uh, whatever size is appropriate that corresponds to the size of the input when I apply the convolution. Okay, so I don't need to do anything really. I just, I just do that convolution. I get the result I want. And then I apply the next layer, which is a pooling two by two. Okay, over the entire input, and then I apply the conv uh, convolution again. So what used to be, um, and let's say I have a fully connected layer here. Okay, so I'm going to add a layer, a fully connected layer here um, to my uh, to my network. Okay, um, so this is what you know, what you would call an F. Okay, the fully connected layer. Um, but in fact, it's not a fully connected layer because to be able to compute this extended uh, uh, convolutional net, uh, what I need to do is use the same weights at every location here for this uh, operation. And it, what it comes down to is a one by one convolution, essentially, right? So I still have shared weights, and uh, which is you know one of the properties of convolution. It's just that now my my kernel, my convolution kernel, only looks at one value. Um, so it's as if I had a convolution kernel of size one by one. Um, but of course, you know, you have multiple channels here, multiple channels here, and you have a whole matrix here between. It shows that this matrix is shared um, uh, across the different locations, right? 
okay, now uh, let's take those two guys and see when we back project, what do they look at? So this guy, uh, the, the red guy here, looks at this input uh, of size six. And the green guy looks at that input, also size six, and the orange guy at, um, I hope I did it right. Uh, I think I screwed up. Okay. I think this guy actually is like that. And, and then this guy is here and this should be ignored. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, now they're shifted by two pixels um, because of this, uh, because of this subsampling, uh, because of this pooling layer that subsamples by a factor of two. If we didn't have any pooling layer, but we only had uh, uh, convolutions with stride, we would have the same effect that a uh, thing would be shifted by whatever the product of the strides of the operations we're doing at, a, uh, at, a, at the various layers uh, is. Okay, so if, if we have a convnet with you know various dense convolutions and then uh, one layer of pooling subsampling with a subsampling ratio of two, and then another layer of pooling and subsampling with subsampling ratio of three, then the overall subsampling ratio is six, which means every output uh, will see a window that is shifted by six pixels uh, compared to the, the previous one. Okay. Any question at this point? Yeah, there are plenty of questions here. So for the animation you showed before with the three and one that were moving and you had the, the, the multiple digits here, yeah, this one. So we had actually three questions which are basically the same. Uh, so how do you deal with multiple characters, right? So someone is asking, uh, do we need knowledge of how many characters are in an image for this method or uh, the number of characters are also limited by the system? So there are several kind of questions about like there's some confusion about the multiple okay. characters. Okay, the, the short answer is you don't need to know how many characters there are um, uh, uh, in the first place, but the proper way to do this requires uh, something called structure prediction. And I'm not gonna talk about this today. Uh, we'll talk about this in a future lecture. There might even be a homework about this. So um, so <laughs> you'll, you'll learn about this, okay, I promise. Um, but, but the short answer is you don't need to know how many characters there are in advance if you, if you design the system uh, properly or train it properly. Um, so you can apply this to any kind of detection, uh, phase detection, pedestrian detection, you know, whatever detection you want, detection of tumors in uh, uh, medical images, things like this. And the idea goes back you know, a very long time as I, as I showed you. Um, uh, you can simultaneously do pose estimation as well. So the example you see at the top, uh, the top left here is uh, some work I did at uh, the uh, NEC uh, Research Institute before I came to NYU in 2003, uh, which was published uh, a couple of years later. And they, um, so they are, this system does pose estimation. So it, the output is not just, you know, is there a face or not, but also what is the orientation of the face? Um, and this is some slightly more recent work. So all of those works are precede the, the craze, the, the, the new craze of uh, around deep learning of the last uh, eight years or so. Um, this is work from, you know, 2010, 2012 or so. Um, yeah, another example of this uh, post-estimation phase detection system. Uh, this is my grandparents' wedding, actually. Um, those are my grandparents. Um, okay, uh, so if you can detect uh, objects, you can also segment images. So what does that mean to segment an image? It means, uh, basically identifying every pixel in an image as to whether it belongs to an object or not. You don't care what the object is maybe, but you care about kind of separating uh, an object from its background or, or classifying each region uh, in, a, in a different way. Um, so this is again, some relatively old work um, where um, we, we train a convolutional net basically to indicate on those microscopic images, whether a particular region or a particular pixel uh, belongs to a cell. This is an embryo of, of uh, little worms, C. elegans. And there is, you can see the, the nucleus of the, of the cell and the cytoplasm and then the uh, outside. And we train this convnet to classify, um, to basically take a, a little region, a very small, a few pixel by a few pixels, and then uh, classify the central pixel of that window as to whether it's 
uh, cytoplasm extra, uh, outside uh, uh, cell um, cell membrane or um, uh, the the nucleus or or the the wall of the nucleus, if you want. Um, the idea there was so you could count like how many cells. That, these are videos actually, and they you can you can count like if you can see automatically more or less if the embryo is developing normally. This is for geneticists uh, of of development, um, and. Um, those are some of the kind of raw results of, uh, you know, each color indicates a category. Uh, those are very noisy image, so you don't get perfect result, but then you can clean them up with something a little bit like, like uh, non-maximum suppression uh, with a little bit of post-processing. And so you get sort of fairly reliable um, idea of, you know, how many cells is, is in this image and uh, if the nuclei have the right shape and things like that. Uh, here's another example, which is um, uh, more impressive. This is also a relatively old work, which I was not involved in, uh, by Sebastian Song, uh, who at the time was at MIT, is at Princeton now. And he's been interested for the last 15 years in what's called connectomics. So this is basically taking a piece of brain, uh, brain tissue, and then slicing it into very, very thin slices, and then analyzing the images so that you can reconstruct the graph of connections of the neurons between them. Uh, so... Uh, so this is a, a, a video, an old video from, you know, the late 2000s, uh, it's probably about 13 years old or so, that, that represent only a small uh, proportion, a small percentage of all the neurons that have been identified. Uh, each neuron has a different color, so they, they run a segmentation algorithm that, you know, uh, tries to figure out after running the convolutional net to identify the boundaries between neurons and, and, and other neurons or between neurons and whatever is in between. Uh, they can reconstruct uh, the, the 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 3D volume of all the neurons and and the dendrites and the axons and whatever, and if they can identify the contacts between neurons, they can also basically reconstruct the the wiring diagram, if you want, of a piece of brain. Um, there is uh, um, the data actually was collected using crowdsourcing uh, uh, at this website here, iwire.org. You can play with that if you want. Uh, and there's a recent review paper that I'm a co-author on uh, called The Mind of a Mouse, and it basically advocates for the fact that we should do this for the entire uh, brain of a mouse. It's been done for the entire brain of uh, the fruit fly, uh, which is very small. But uh, right now, we just don't have the technology to do it for a brain that's larger than that. And so this is basically a call for, uh, you know, a kind of uh, uh, project, you know, worldwide or, or, or national to um, uh, essentially figure out the entire wiring diagram of uh, the brain of a, a given mouse. The amount of data that would be required for this is absolutely staggering. Uh, a mouse has maybe 50 million neurons. Um, so it's actually smaller than some of the neural nets that are being uh, used in practice today. But, uh, but it's, it's, it's absolutely gigantic in terms of uh, uh, connections and the complexity of it. Um, so that's a really interesting application of convolutional net to science and to neuroscience in particular. Um, and it, it goes back, you know, 15 years or so. Um, this is an old video. There's more recent ones that you can you can get by looking for Sebastian Song uh, Lab at Princeton. Uh, here is another application of uh, of image segmentation. So this is the same idea where you uh, you also take a a, uh, a window over an image. So so here this was a three dimensional window. Okay, in this example that's taken. And then you train a convolutional net looking at this little window. You train the convolutional net to tell you whether the pixel, the voxel you're looking at is, uh, you know, the inside of a neuron, the outside of a neuron, or the, the, the membrane, if you want. Okay. So that afterwards you can post-process and kind of do this segmentation. Uh, this is the same idea here, but it's two-dimensional. Uh, this is about, this was done about the same time, actually, maybe a couple of years ago, you know, roughly about the same time. And this is the idea of uh, what in computer vision is called semantic segmentation. So, uh, so here you, um, you, you run a convolutional net with a sliding window over an, an entire image. Uh, you take a, a window, uh, uh, so the, the input window that corresponds to a particular output in this convolutional net, uh, in this case, is something like 40 pixels by 40 pixels or something like that. Uh, and you train the system to label the central pixel as to whether, in this case, whether it's something the robot can drive over or whether it's an obstacle that the, the robot, you know, would bump into and cannot, or cannot, cannot traverse, like, you know, tall grass and things like that and uh, uh, brushes. 
so this was um, a project that was only in my lab at NYU between 2005 and 2008, uh, and uh, directed by um, uh, when it involved um, Raya Hetzel and Pierre Samane, who were the, the two main uh, contributors to that project in my lab, but there were a large cast of characters that was in, in collaboration with uh, uh, a startup company in New Jersey called N Netscale Technology, which now actually um, belongs to NVIDIA. So they actually work on uh, autonomous driving at NVIDIA. Uh, Raya Hetzel is uh, a head of robotics research at DeepMind. Uh, Pierre Samane is also working in robotics, but at Google, uh, Google Brain. Um, so anyway, so here um, the data was actually collected semi-automatically. So we just ran the, the, the robot in nature and we used a, a stereo vision system to figure out if a particular pixel is on the ground or above the ground. And from that, we can derive a label, okay? Uh, and, and this is the, uh, the, the kind of labeling here at the bottom in the center that you would get from this stereo vision system. And the problem with stereo vision is that it only works at a limited range. So it works up to about 10 meters and then beyond, be, beyond 10 meters, you can't tell really uh, from you know, triangulation with two cameras, you can't tell uh, if a particular pixel you're looking at is on the ground or above the ground. Um, so that has kind of limited range. You can't really drive a robot in nature if your vision stops at 10 meters. Uh, you can avoid obstacles, but you can plan a long range uh, path. So um, what we do is we use those labels to train a convolutional net to label the pixel, but the convolutional net only needs uh, a single camera image. So it doesn't rely on, on stereo. Uh, and so it's not limited in range. And when we apply the convolutional net to the entire image, it tells us, well, the path continues. Um, in fact, this convolutional net is, not, is, is trained in the lab on, on collected data, uh, but it's, uh, it also kind of trains itself on the fly as it drives. So the last layer is actually trained online. Um, and, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to sp spare you the, the details. Um, this is the architecture of the convolutional net. It actually looks at uh, images that are kind of bands, if you want, uh, more or less centered on the horizon, because it doesn't need to tell you know to look at the sky and the you know, uh, and anything else at multiple scales. So it uses this multi-scale idea that I uh, I told told you about earlier. Uh, and this is sort of a, a video that shows how the system uh, works more or less. Uh, okay, so um, so you get uh, labels from stereo vision. You also get labels from the, the neural net and you can reconstruct where every pixel is in the world because you know roughly what the distance. And so you can put this in a map. This map is represented here at the top. Um, and the, the map, you know, the content on the map, uh, if it's green indicates that the robot probably can drive there. And if it's purple, it's probably the, an obstacle. If it's red, it's also an obstacle. If it's blue, it just means like, I haven't seen this. It's obstructed, the view is obstructed by an obstacle, so I can't tell. Uh, so I'm going to avoid going there. Uh, and then you can run a shortest path uh, planning algorithm to kind of uh, get the robot to go somewhere. So this is the robot being annoyed by uh, graduate students. This is Raya Hetzel on the right and Pierre Samane on the left. And they are making the life of this robot pretty impossible. Um, they're entitled to do this because they actually built the code for it. Uh, they didn't build a robot that was given to us by DARPA. Um, and they were pretty confident the system was working well because um, if the robot didn't stop before their legs, they could break their legs. <laughs> um, okay, so a couple of years later, uh, uh, a few data sets appeared that had a small number of uh, images, something like 2000 images or so, uh, where people had labeled every pixel in images with a category. So not just, you know, is it traversable or not, but is it a window, is it a door, is it a sidewalk, is it a road, is it a car, is it a person, etc., or is it a tree? Uh, so that's the problem of what's called category level semantic segmentation. Um, and we built um, one of the first, you know, the first system using convolutional nets for this, uh, you know, around 2000, 2010 or so, um, and published it in 2012. Uh, the computer vision community at the time was extremely skeptical uh, in 2011 uh, of, of convolutional nets. And um, even though this paper kind of beat the record on the data set, it was actually rejected from, from CVPR. Uh, we published it in a machine learning conference in ICML uh, six months later. Um, so this, there was a lot of uh, skepticism for those methods back then. They just didn't believe that the result could be so good because they never heard of that method. 
So it's it's interesting to kind of you know reflect on the history of this. Um, uh, a certain degree of skepticism is 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 a good thing in science because you have to be skeptical about uh, surprising result and and kind of confirm them. You know, it didn't take that long for for this uh, to be confirmed. Uh, so that's the architecture of the network. It's again a convolutional net that is applied at multiple scales. So the same image is subsampled. Uh, the input window of this uh, neural net is uh, 46 by 46. So every input here is influenced by a 46 by 46 window. It's applied with a sliding window. And then you apply the same convolutional net at multiple scales. Um, but then uh, the features of all of those scales are combined before going to the final classification. Um, so th there's a lot of ideas along those lines that uh, uh, a lot of different ways of doing this now that, that people use. I'll, I'll show some examples later. Uh, but if you want more details about this, uh, you know, essentially you should take a the computer vision, you know, Rob Ferguson's computer vision class. That's really, he goes into the gory details of how you, how you do this. Um, so that's an example of this uh, system uh, running. Uh, we're able to actually build a, uh, so this could not run in real time on the CPUs at the time. GPUs were not popular yet. Uh, so we implemented like a, a special piece of hardware on what's called an FPGA, which is sort of configurable hardware so that we can run this. And Alfredo is familiar with this because he worked with this as well. Um, and and this, this was kind of the results. Uh, this, this is uh, Washington Square Park, if you don't recognize it. Uh, the system is far from perfect. You know, it recognizes the, those bright spots here as, as desert or sand. And, you know, this is the middle of Manhattan. There is no sand, no desert, certainly. Um, so, the, but that was as good as it, as it was at the time. Um, and we could run it at about um, 20 frames per second on you know, a special piece of hardware that was about this big, okay? So this was sort of the groundwork that kind of convinced people, um, some people at the time that you could, uh, you could actually implement those things in hardware and you could you know, pretty much have this in your, in your car and it could help you drive, drive a car. Uh, there's a long history of hardware in neural nets, which I'm not gonna go into. I might go in, into it at a later lecture, but people started working on neural net hardware back in the 1980s. Um, okay, so what happened uh, around uh, 2012, 2013, is the fact that uh, uh, our friends at University of Toronto in Jeff Hinton's group, Elias Sitzgaver and Alex Krzyzewski, uh, had a very good implementation of convolutional nets on GPU, and that allowed them to train a very large convolutional net uh, on, on a, a single GPU at the time, or two GPUs actually, on the ImageNet data set. And the ImageNet data set was the first data set in, in computer vision that had a large number of training samples and a large number of categories. So it had 1 million training samples, roughly 1.3 million and uh, 1,000 categories. And it turns out that's really what convolutional nets love. If you have many categories, many training samples, they really shine and they basically beat um, uh, everything else. So uh, what you see here is the error rate uh, for what's called the, the top five error rate on, uh, on this uh, ImageNet data set. And 2010, 2011, people used uh, more classical approaches where uh, a lot of the things were handcrafted. The architecture looked a bit like a convolutional net, but it was you know, basically handcrafted, was not trained with backprop. Uh, and the best people could get was 25.8% 20, error. Uh, AlexNet uh, in 2012 got, got this down to 16%. And that was a watershed moment. Everybody in computer vision essentially stopped what they were doing and switched to using convolutional nets. So the people who didn't basically regretted not doing it. So they did it the year after. Um, and you know, every alternative approach to uh, uh, object recognition was basically abandoned within two years. Uh, and the error rate you know, kept going down. Now it's below human um, error, essentially, for, for, for top five. Uh, but people use, still use ImageNet as a, um, as, as a benchmark. Um, and what happened uh, during that, that period is that the, the number of layers of those networks basically grew um, uh, dramatically, particularly with the uh, uh, invention of the, the, the ResNet architecture. So this was a paper by Kai Ming He in uh, 2015. The paper was actually published in 2016, but it was an archive in 2015. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit about this. So the basic idea of, uh, of, uh, of a ResNet is to by default, make a group of, of, of two or three layers uh, compute the identity function. So it basically copies its input on its output, okay? You don't change the size, you don't do anything. Um, you just copy the input on the output. And then you have a few layers of, uh, of a neural net that, uh, 
compute the deviation from the uh, other or the so-called residual uh, from the um, from the identity. So um, there's various ways of building those things, and you stack them up. So this is a, a particular network called uh, ResNet 34. But I would say the the workhorse of uh, image recognition, the thing that every, every everybody uses or compare themselves to, is ResNet 50. It's a particular architecture. This is a you know object, a, a class in PyTorch. You can just you can just build ResNet 50 without thinking about it. There's a lot of variations of this. Um, and you can go to this URL and and check the, the the current state of the art on ImageNet. There is like various types of uh, uh, papers with code. Is is a small company that was recently acquired by by Facebook that you know basically sort of organizes all the results and papers that people have. This is a chart a few years old. It's about uh, four and a half years old that uh, Alfredo put together. Alfredo, you should probably make a more recent version of this uh, that indicates it's online. Uh, the number of you know billion of operations on the x-axis. And on the y-axis is the uh, top one accuracy on on ImageNet, and you know there's you know various versions here of ResNet and Inception, which is sort of a Google uh, proposed uh, architecture. And you know there's a lot more now, and people are up to ninety percent now, but they use you know something else on supervised learning. Okay, I'm gonna drop out, so I'm gonna stop here and uh, let. Uh, mm -hmm. Actually, before yeah, before you disappear, I wanted to do yes. like to wish happy birthday to our TAs. They were born the same day, so they oh, have wow. okay. remind us one <laughs> one time less. Amazing. <laughs> all right, all right. So good luck with okay. your presentation on the other side, and I keep I keep here the the audience uh, enjoyed. All right. Bye. Okay, great. Take care, everyone. <laughs> all right. Bye bye.